It's arguably the greatest dynasty in NFL history. The Patriots winning six Super Bowl titles with Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. And now we get an inside look at the highs and lows of that run, courtesy of Apple TV Plus's The Dynasty, New England Patriots. Episodes one and two are available right now. We have Michael Hawley here. We have Tom Curran here. I'm Phil Perry. We are going to go over this thing with a fine tooth comb. We're going to have mm. a lot of fun yep. reminiscing. Nostalgia, Woo. to me, is the big picture takeaway from these first two episodes. If you were like me sitting at home and you were in high school as this was happening, oh, wow. I wasn't boots on the ground high the way school. these two were. He said Sophomore high school. in high school following this team with every single breath. I loved it. I loved everything that it brought to the table. All of the unseen video, Brady at his new pad, mm -hmm. bought from Ty Law. All of the behind-the-scenes stuff that we hadn't heard from in-game before, Brady being drafted. There was a lot of stuff, even for somebody like me, who covers the team now and has for the last 10 years, that is completely new. Tom, what was your big-picture takeaway after watching the first two episodes? Personally, the, the biggest feeling I had was one of gratitude. You mentioned the greatest dynasty in NFL history, arguably. I'd take the arguably away, and I would call it the greatest dynasty, especially over a compressed period in the history of American professional sports. And I was lucky enough to be there to watch it, to experience it, to be as close as anyone could be to the argument, Brady or Bledsoe, and to actually have felt as if Drew Bledsoe was doomed. That was one takeaway that I would have globally on the series is, in these first two episodes, the entire landscape is, is laid out, Michael, as to what was going on. But I feel as if the vulnerability of Drew Bledsoe was much more clear after he had gone 5-13 and 13 and Bill Belichick had undressed him numerous times. The fan base was ready for a change, regardless of that $100 million contract. Mm. Yeah, Tom, I'm, I'm glad you said it that way, too, like the gratitude. Because let's face it, it changed our lives. I mean, we were able to, one, just from a, a sports observers and sports commentators standpoint, we were able to see football at such a high level. But because of that, uh, certain things, you know, we got interviews that uh, we wouldn't normally get. We got opportunities that we wouldn't normally get all because we were associated loosely mm -hmm. with the greatest, that's right, arguably taken away from that, the greatest dynasty in NFL history. What stood out to me was watching young Tom Brady. Tom Brady, when no one knew who he was. Uh, the anonymous Brady. It, I think it's the most genuine Brady we've seen as Patriots fans. It's like seeing Brad Pitt before he was famous. It's like seeing Mick Jagger uh, like in a dive bar. You know, like he's talking trash, the tech mobile uh, tricks that he used to have, the back and forth with David Nugent. I mean, I thought that was all great stuff. And Phil, the competitiveness as we... Think about it. No, we're not talking about the, you know, the Patriots of, of current day. But when you look at a quarterback and the traits that you want, give me that stuff. Give me that guy who's insatiable. I, I, I got to get better. I want to keep fighting. I, I, I'm going to throw. I'm going to throw the remote against the wall and put a hole I'm in. I'm going to walk around the neighborhood with a baseball yeah, bat in my hand and pound oh, it yeah. into my palm until I get drafted. Give yeah. me that guy. What's our feeling on Drew Bledsoe? Because he is the star. I always believed he was articulate, incredibly articulate intelligent, um, the, a kind of a man's man. But by 2000, 2001, he was exhausted. He was world weary and beaten down. He had gone from Parcells to Pete Carroll. He'd gone through a million offensive coordinators. And he felt and seemed as if he had seen it all before. And there's an entitlement to Drew Bledsoe, I f believe, that comes out in this episode, Phil. We've always heard Drew was the the best teammate, and I'm like, hey, he looked good at the podium, but there was plenty of... Yeah, there's a lot of stuff behind it. What scenes. about me? And the what about right. me he would have deserved if it wasn't that he was unbelievably vulnerable because he wasn't playing that great. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this Brady Bledsoe, quote-unquote, controversy because the meat and the potatoes of episode one involved the quarterback controversy between Bledsoe and Brady, a young Brady, taking over for Bledsoe, of course, after that hit from Mo Lewis that we'll never forget, and Brady never gave his job back, which he was very open about talking about mm -hmm. with his teammates. And there's great clips from Lawyer Malloy and Ty Law about their memories of being at dinner with Tom Brady and Brady letting them know, I ain't giving this bleep back. And they laughed at him is how they remember it. And I wonder, Michael, did you get that sense covering the team the way you did at that point in time that, that players were very wary of this guy stepping into Bledsoe's shoes and actually being able to have success no matter how confident he was. Well, I think Tom is right. There was, a, there was an appetite for something else, uh, something different. And Brady, not only the entitlement, Tom, 
I think the lack of awareness of, of Tom Brady and how he was pushing him. So Brady, Brady in 2000, as the fourth quarterback, got the coach's attention, not because he was great he kept, at that they, point. They kept all four in the active yeah, roster. They kept, okay, well you keep four quarterbacks on the roster and you say, this guy is not a threat. Hey, Tom, they kept, I mean, I, I mean, it's true. They kept four quarterbacks. Active, not yeah. even on the practice squad. So th that should have been the first clue. The other, the other thing, the Brady advantage that Bledsoe didn't take into consideration. In 2000, Charlie Weiss was a new offensive coordinator. That means Brady and Bledsoe got a new offense at the same time. It was just a matter of who was going to devour it more, who was going to be into it. So Brady intellectually was right there with Bledsoe in knowledge of the offense. He had no inside info there. And the other thing is, and I was talking with Tom about this before the show started, we both remember 2001, Tom Brady had a fantastic training camp. And there was a meeting in August among the coaches, and they said, hey, Tom Brady uh, is probably our best quarterback right now, but we got to go with Bledsoe. Well, and, and Michael makes a great point, Tom, where he talks about Charlie Weiss coming in and bringing a new offense because the people who very clearly in the Dynasty series that paint a picture of Drew was done. He was cooked, and they yep. were polite about it. it. was the guys in charge. It was Bill Belichick, Scott Pioli, and Ernie Adams. You heard from players who believed – well, this was our guy, yeah. and we're not sure about – what had Brady ever done? Ta Teddy Bruschi is one of Tom Brady's great friends right now. Tom had never done a damn thing for us, and so why would we believe in him in that moment? Laughed at him when Brady went to the front of the room and told these guys, hey, believe in me because I'm going to be pretty damn good here. Drew, Drew Bledsoe's strength was that he was a downfield thrower. He was not a rhythm thrower. He was not an accurate thrower. He was a big arm, strong – you know, Marino-esque player, but he was not quick and he wasn't a quick decision maker and they needed a quick decision maker with this offense. And just to actually amplify the attitude, I, I, I went back and found this quote for the hell of it. This is Lawyer Malloy from September 26, 2001. Quote, talking to some of the guys on the off offensive side of the ball, they said Brady goes in there and will say, okay, look guys, I need a little more. Or run a good route because I'm coming to you. He's just that kind of vocal presence that I think they need over there right now. That is the days after Bledsoe got hurt. That was before his first start. These he hadn't even played guys a game yet. believed that Brady was better. And I, I just don't know why, whether it be Charlie Weiss or I've heard guys in the past say nobody knew it was coming. Well, nobody knew this, nobody knew this, was, this coming. was coming. But you did know that Bledsoe was very vulnerable. Well, memory's a funny thing too, right, Michael? I mean, this is a long time ago now. We're talking 20-plus right. years. And I wonder if guys – who are still friends with Drew and who liked Drew at the time and like him now, view it as, in moments like these, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, they don't want to run up the scoreboard on Drew. And so if they, today, sitting down in a chair on a, on a docu-series that's going to be viewed by millions of people, say, we knew all along that Tom Brady <laughs> was a lot better than Drew Bledsoe, how does that come off? We and so I yeah. wonder if their, their perspective has changed at all because we know that that happens with memory, we're all human. But that's right. But I think the truth is somewhere in the middle here. It's fair to say that. You know, Ty Law on the documentary says he wasn't Tom Brady the GOAT. He was just Tom. And even Tom said, hey, uh, we won that game, but it wasn't because of my stellar quarterback play. So it, it wasn't Tom Brady that we saw in 2003, 2004, but it was a Brady who was ready, who was ready to take the job and had the confidence. The confidence was always there. We saw that. I mean, and, and can, we, can I just say, as, as a quick aside, shame on the, the NFL. NFL draft evaluators still haven't learned their lessons. I'm not saying they should have known that Tom Brady was going to be the greatest of all time. But stop it. Chad Pennington, your first quarterback taken. Hey, I like Chad Pennington. I, I know you did. But, uh, but you, I think you like Tom Brady better than Chad Pennington. T. Martin. You also like Gardner T, Minshew T. and T. Sam Martin Arnold. before Tom Brady. Palco. Gio Carmazzi before <laughs> Tom Brady. Like, stop this. And we still have a, a lot of these big swings and misses because with time, I think sometimes evaluators overthink it. Hey, Tom Brady, despite what the story is, he did play at Michigan. I saw him play as an Ohio State fan. I saw him play many games in Michigan. He was a captain. He won his last game in dramatic fashion against Alabama, I think, in the Orange Bowl. So he was a big-time college football player that the NFL missed. One of the best things about these first two episodes to me is you get to see the start of a love story. <laughs> if you want to put it that way, between Belichick and Brady. And Belichick talks openly about how Brady pushed him to be the best version of himself. And there's great clips of them showing up to the facility before the sun has even come up. What did you make of Bill's performance 
yeah. and how he reacted to some of the questions that he got in those Oof. first two episodes. As you watch this, you'll see Michael Hawley does the best job, I think, of, and Michael and I are both in the series at different junctures. I come in a little later with the, the drama. Um, but Mike did an excellent job of talking about why they were wedded, why Belichick and Brady were such soulmates, and how much Brady pushed Belichick. And Belichick would always talk about that. Tom was so prepared that I had to have stuff for him because I wasn't teaching him anything that he didn't know. He needed more, more, more. But what was so striking about Belichick is he worked in 2000 and 2001 to renovate his reputation when he arrived in New yes, England. Yes, he did, Tom. He spent a lot yep. of time with a lot of different writers, not me because I was still at the Metro West Daily News and not rising to the level of being able to be paid attention to. But he spent a lot of time trying to show that he was approachable. And you're going to see it prior to the Snow Bowl Belichick on the sidelines, Steve Burton is wishing that he could get the treatment that whatever sideline reporter before the snowball got, because he's like, yeah, I think we're, we're going to be okay out there. The footing isn't bad. It'll be all right. And I'm telling you, Steve Burton just spent 23 years getting his forehead peed on by Bill before every freaking preseason game. But Bill then was, I'm not saying warm and cuddly. What an image. Thank but you. smiley, enjoyable, so, so informative, and able to be jousted with, actually, because you didn't have social media appearing over your shoulder and saying, oh, you just started something with the coach, you're after him here. No, that's, that was the job. We're across purposes. We're doing that. And even when he's getting hard questions, Michael, about are you going to go with Bledsoe now that he's been cleared to play and he's healthy enough to play, are you going to stick with Tom Brady? There is a little bit more of a back yeah. and forth than we're used to seeing over the course of the last few years here, where if it's a question that he doesn't like or he doesn't want to get into, it's – a lot of one-word answers. Yeah, it, you know, now in, in 2023, it became, in, and before, 22, 21, hey, I'm doing what's best for the team, I'm doing what's next question, whatever, on in Cincinnati, all this stuff. But then, remember, he spelled it out. I'm doing what's best for the T-E-A-M team. That's what Mr. Kraft is paying me to do, and, and I'm doing what's best and all this stuff. But I, I would say uh, also the, the connection between Bill and Tom, don't, don't get caught up in the – the, the superficial differences between them. You know, one guy looks like a supermodel and 6'4", and you know, very handsome. The other guy is just like the, you know, kind of the dour coach and who's kind of just all on the, you know, we see the, the clips when he's got the glasses on in Cleveland and he's going, the, the math professor. What really drew them together was their insatiable love for football. Insatiable. And so that's what, that's what Belichick was drawn to. And, that, and Drew didn't have that. I mean, Drew was very talented, but Drew – could move on from football after practice. Practice, hey, football's over. He was ready to quit, but he lost the I'm, job. I'm gonna drink my wine and, mo and move on. And, and Brady was never like that. Not ready to quit, but you'll see him. Well, kind of. He did say that. It, I thought and he one, said of my, it. one of my favorite, even though Bill, in the first two episodes at least, we, we don't get a ton from him in terms of words that we're hearing. I think you got a lot of insight into his thought processes at the time via Ernie. There's so many tremendous interviews that are. Um, a part of this series already, you can see through the first two episodes. Ernie Adams, Scott Pioli, Adam Vinatieri, I thought had the quote of all quotes where he's saying, that team in 2001, this is after the snowball, that wasn't Bill's team, that wasn't Tom's team, there was no star on that team, and we all had ownership of that team because of that, and I feel like Bill Belichick was speaking through Vinatieri in that moment. Okay, much more coming up on the Dynasty here. After the show, tonight, after early edition, maybe before BST Fridays, you're going to want to listen to this podcast if you haven't already. Check out the latest Patriots Talk podcast for much more on the Dynasty Series. Tommy Kern catching up with the director, Matt Hamachek. You can scan the QR code on the screen or find it on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube. Coming up, we're joined by a very special guest as Jeff Benedict, author of the Dynasty, stops by to discuss the docuseries. Let's just say we have plenty of questions to ask him. Stick around. All right, we're continuing to discuss the docuseries, The Dynasty, The New England Patriots, with episodes one and two available now on Apple TV+. Plus. And joining us now is the author of the best-selling book, which this entire docuseries is based on, Jeff Benedict. Jeff, thanks so much for being with us here. So much work we know went into this. I'm curious as to your thoughts on some of the conversation we just had a little bit earlier in the show when it comes to memory. And, and how things are perceived now versus when you're going through some of the source material, how they were perceived back then and how those things competed against each other or complemented each other. How do you choose what to use, what to focus on in a situation like that? Well, because the story has such a long arc, 
Um, I think we felt as filmmakers, I certainly felt this as a writer, is that the first couple episodes should be more nostalgic. I mean, those, those early years uh, where Tom and Bill are new. Tom's like a, a boy, Bill's a new coach. Um, there's a lot of nostalgia in that part of the Dynasty series. We know that's gonna change dramatically over time, but we thought for viewers, for fans, that beginning is it should feel nostalgic because it was different. And, and Jeff, you know, you talk about the beginning, and I was going to ask you this off the air. I said, no, I'm going to ask him on the air. <laughs> I, I think people need to understand, like, how long this process, this project was in the making. Sure. So when did you do the first interview for the Apple uh, sure. TV piece of it? When did that first happen? So how long? For me, totally, the, pro the whole process was six years. But the documentary itself... I started thinking about it and kind of putting the pieces together for it uh, in like March of 2020, right as I finished writing the last scene for the book. And by the fall, uh, as Tom is starting as a buccaneer, we were really starting to ramp up getting a streamer on invo involved, getting the production company involved, um, then getting Matt Hamacek to come in. Our first interview though is like a year and a half after that. And, and so that was two years ago we did our first interview. It was actually Paul Tagliabue who doesn't even end, make the cut. cut. But that was our first interview. <laughs> sorry, Tags. That's what I was, sorry. Hall of Famer, Tags. Didn't make it. Hey, uh, when you go into this venture, it has to begin with somebody. You have to ask somebody first. You're yes. not going to ask Ernie yeah. Adams. You're going to go to Robert Kraft. In going to Robert Kraft, he said, yeah. he's told me in the past, I've had oodles of opportunities to tell my story, but I chose Jeff Benedict. Why did he choose you? And did he have any say editorially, or in, I don't want that out there, I'd like this out there, can we, can we say how great I was, any of that? Yeah, so first of all, um, I mean, I chose him and them first, because I approached them, obviously, they didn't approach me. Right. Uh, I approached the team, and when I said team, I went to the owner first, because being an outsider, you guys are not outsiders. I'm a total outsider, right? I have no connection to the team, so the way I looked at it as an outsider was, if I want to get inside the organization, I need to go to the top of the organization. I don't need to go to Tom Brady or Bill or anyone mm -hmm. else. I need to go to the owner. And, and so that's why I went there. I mean, call me naive or whatever, but that, that's where I started. And so similarly, having worked on the book for two plus years, when I wanted to pursue a documentary series, I did the same thing. Um, but it was different this time because now I had a relationship. Mm -hmm. I wasn't an outsider anymore in the sense that they, now they knew who I was and they partly knew what they were getting because I'd been around them for two plus years. And I really, when I first presented it, it was like I wanted to take what's in this book and turn it into a film. Was there anything in it that editorially that, that Kraft like objected to because I think there's a perception right as you know in this in sure. this region owners are always under the gun yeah and Robert Kraft is always under the gun despite all the great things that I think he has yeah. done and people criticize him he always want you know they used to call him red light Kraft early on in his tenure here mm -hmm. so what's your perception of how much involvement he had or overrule or say and I don't want that out there yeah he didn't he didn't have editorial control over the film just like he didn't have editorial control over the book I think that's why the trust factor is so important, and, and not just with me, but also you know, when Matt Hamachek comes into the process. You, you have to have trust in the filmmaker mm -hmm. and in the production company, imagine. We had at the top of that company, Ron Howard and Brian Grazier, who have great reputations. It's so you at least know you're gonna get a quality product from the production side, but I think a lot of it was knowing, look, in order for this film to be credible, I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah. You can't write a book and expect people to buy it and believe it, if you're gonna skip over Aaron Hernandez and Spygate and Deflategate and the fracture that is eventually gonna happen with Bill and Tom, if you're gonna either skip or dance around those things, you lose credibility. The first time you'd lose credibility is in 2007 mm -hmm. in the story. It's easy to write to 07, it's because nothing really happened. <laughs> right. That's problematic. Right. But when you get to 07 and you get accused of cheating, how are you gonna deal with that as a writer? And how are you going to do with that as filmmakers? My view was, if you don't just plow straight into it, then you're, that's when you're going to lose the audience. You know what, Jeff? Uh, just from uh, a viewer's perspective, yeah. and, and you have a different pers perspective on this. When I looked at Bill Belichick in this series, 
He looked uncomfortable. He looked reluctant to talk, especially compared to Kraft, who went back and was anecdotal and told yes. some jokes. Uh, Tom Brady, as I said off the top, Tom Brady was profane and hilarious and competitive and, and just really into the spirit of it. Bill looked uncomfortable. Do you agree with that assessment? And, and if so, why? Why was he like that? Um, I, I think, you know, he, he is clearly uncomfortable. You can't look at the interview and say he looks right at home. Um, he's, he's not right at home. The, the truth is, I don't, this is not um, the world that Bill is comfortable in, and it's not a world he's really ever lived in. Um, this is not NFL films, right? This is not really a football film. That sounds weird to say that because this is about the greatest football team of all time. But it's really not a football story. Um, that's just the skeletal framework of it. And I think so for Bill, we're not asking Bill about w what he did on third and ten. This is not that story. Robert and Tom, I think, are more sort of naturally inclined to, to be able to talk about things that are personal to them. It, Tom cries in the film, in the series, right? Robert gets choked up at times in the series. And, and it's not hard for them to get to that emotional point. Bill is like programmed to never get there. And so when you put him in this environment, this is a very foreign place for him to be. And I just think that that's part of what you're talking about, Michael, when you say he looks uncomfortable. I mean, just look at the way people are dressed. Willie McGinnis comes in a sweatsuit because that's who he is. Tom Brady came the way he, Robert wears the same blue coat you see him wear all the time, right? How does Bill look? Is he in a hooded sweatshirt? No, he's in a suit and tie. You never see Bill in a suit and tie. He just doesn't like the garnishes and the decorativeness. And he would rather talk about football in a sweatshirt to a room full of offensive line coaches than sit there because uh, having heard him, Phil, you and I have covered him for a long time now, it would seem it's excessive, it's unnecessary, we don't want this, this is just a, a credit grab. Right. But then deep down, you always wonder if the credit grabbing that was always done was quietly done by Bill. What's interesting is he's the guy who always says you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, right? But he's very clearly uncomfortable <laughs> here, and it doesn't yeah. yield amazing results, at least through the first two episodes. What was the most uncomfortable it got as, as people who are putting this together and asking these hard questions, whether it's Aaron Hernandez or Spygate or anything else, yeah. what was the most uncomfortable you were on that side of things broaching some of these topics? Well, I think, you know, look, the Aaron Hernandez stuff was, was difficult for everybody involved, including those of us who were uh, preparing and asking questions, because this is something that is so unusual to be talking about in the context of, of sports. And uh, some players who are in the series who talked for the first time about it, Dion Branch in particular, mm -hmm. who lived across the street from Aaron, his interview was so... Um, emotional and revealing for him that I, I was sitting there when Dion was talking, I, I literally couldn't believe what I was hearing from him. You could hear a pin drop in the studio that day. I mean, there were times when there were just gaps of silence because he was, he was pausing and, and actually auditing himself about what he didn't do back at the time. And it was just his honesty and his candor was, I mean, it just stunned everybody. So you go from that range to then having to ask people, you know, when we cover the Donald Trump stuff. Yeah. I mean, you talk about uncomfortable. Woo. When, we, when we have those interviews with uh, Devin McCourty, with Matthew Slater, with some of the players that were in the locker room and were the leaders of the team at that time, that was, I mean, the tension in the studio when that interview, those interviews were happening were remarkable. And so I don't know that I could point to one thing and say that was the most. We had one interview with Teddy Bruschi, and we interviewed Teddy multiple times, but I remember this one well. It was in Boston, and his wife was there for this one, and um, Teddy was talking about what it was like to play for Bill. And that hasn't come up yet, but, man, we had to break in the middle of the interview. Mm. Well, unfortunately, we have to break right now. We could talk to you all night about the first two episodes of the dynasty out on apple tv plus right now watch it if you haven't already jeff thank you so much tommy carmichael holly thank you can't wait to go over the rest of the series over the next few weeks stick with us